This video will discuss the basic algorithmic procedure of molecular dynamics. So several videos ago, we discussed ensemble properties, how we want to use simulations to compute some average value of a particular chemical system of interest. And the way to do that is to do what's called a Boltzmann weighted average over all the possible configurations of the system. But that's often very difficult to do. So instead, what we can do is use what's called molecular dynamics and do a time simulation and simulate the molecule through classical mechanics over a large period of time and hopefully obtain some trajectory over which we can average those properties to a value which is a reasonably accurate approximation to the true system. Okay, so as I mentioned there, we're going to calculate <clears throat> various system properties by propagating our system through time and averaging the values over time. So in classical mechanics, uh, we obey what's called Newton's laws, right? things like force equals mass times acceleration, um, uh, Newton's three laws, all those sorts of things. So the molecular mechanics energy function that we discussed in the previous chapter that is what you would call a conservative time independent potential energy function. So it does not vary in time. The potential energy doesn't depend on time. It just depends on interatomic distances between our various molecular XYZ coordinates. And it's what you call conservative because uh, the total energy is a constant throughout time if you uh, compute the equations correctly. So the kinetic energy and the potential energy can vary, but their sum, the total energy, is always what you call a conserved value. All right, so we have Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. We remind ourselves that acceleration is the second derivative of position with respect to time, which is the time derivative of mass times the uh, derivative of position with respect to time which is equal to the derivative of mass times velocity. Velocity is the first derivative of position with respect to time. And mass times velocity is what we would call the momentum. So our force is actually equal to the first derivative of momentum with respect to time. All right, and force additionally for our conservative time independent potential energy function Force, as we showed in the gradient video, is equal to the negative first derivative of potential energy with respect to position. So we have momentum equals mass times velocity is equal to the mass times first derivative with respect to time. So if we put all these things together, what we have is that the partial derivative of the momentum of a particle in the x direction with respect to time is equal to the negative partial derivative of potential energy with respect to x position over time or with respect to x position so this is basically what we'd say is the uh, the rate of change of our momentum is equal to the negative rate of change of our potential energy so this if we had a one dimensional system would be what we call a differential equation, a partial differential equation in one dimension. And what we would do is we would solve this for our given coordinate. But this being a system of molecules, we have atoms. Each atom is represented as a different point particle with an XYZ coordinate. So three coordinates per particle. And we have N particles. So that, so that gives us overall three N coordinates. So those 3n coordinates, each of them have an equation like this, and we have to solve it in every dimension that we have. So overall, what we have there is a situation that we typically can't solve. So typically, it's impossible to solve this equation exactly, or it's prohibitively difficult to solve it exactly. So what we do is approximate this numerically with this following type of procedure. So our first step is to assign some initial velocities, as we mentioned in our assign some initial coordinates, as we mentioned in the geometry optimization video, assign some initial velocities, i.e. momentum, in our uh, 
assign initial momentum as we mentioned in the thermal energy video and set the time equal to zero. Then we're going to compute our energy, potential energy, compute uh, the gradient of the potential energy. We're going to update our coordinates. Our coordinates are going to move the next iteration's coordinates are going to be the current iteration's coordinates plus <clears throat> the velocity times delta t. <clears throat> So we have 1 over mass times momentum, which is just velocity. So we have x plus velocity times delta t. Then we have update our momentum. Our new momentum is going to be our old momentum minus the gradient of our potential energy times delta t, which is going to be our acceleration. So we do this, and we do every one of those steps. And at each of one of those steps 3 and 4, the time increases. The new time is the old time plus delta t. We repeat this and do all these three steps here until the time reaches the final time that we want to simulate. And then finally, we compute whatever properties of our system we desire. So some interesting facts here would be that this delta t, the time step, that's the smallest amount of time or the largest amount of time typically that you can use that doesn't result in error in your function. So we mentioned that the total energy is conserved over time. So as soon as this total energy starts to vary too much, we know our time step is getting too big. The time step is typically constrained by the fastest time scale motion in your system. Usually that's the vibrations of things that involve hydrogen atoms for us. And typically that occurs on the order of about 10 femtoseconds or 10 to the minus 14 seconds. So usually our time steps are on the order of 1 femtosecond or 10 to the minus 15 seconds. So this means that it takes on the order of, uh, of a thousand trillion or a million billion a quadrillion uh, number of time steps to simulate a system for one second. Although the most advanced simulations in the world certainly are approaching a second worth of simulation, enough to do things like fold an entire protein or do some type of macromolecular self-assembly. So the time you want to simulate typically depends on whatever goals you have. The vibrations in systems, those occur on timescales usually of you know 10 to 100 femtoseconds, less than a picosecond, one trillionth of a second. Conformational changes in molecules, like bending of various torsion angles, going from uh, you know uh, gauche to staggered, things like timescales of picoseconds, you know, uh, changing secondary structures in proteins, picoseconds to nanoseconds, diffusion of things through uh, through solution, interaction of host and guest targets, things like protein binding, nucleic acid binding, those sorts of good things nanoseconds to microseconds, and something like protein folding, which is a very common type of application for molecular dynamics, would be in the time scale of microseconds all the way to full seconds. A lot of the large, longest time scale molecular dynamic simulations are large scale protein folding simulations. So I have a fully functional program in my uh, GitHub computational chemistry repository, which will be detailing a little bit later in this chapter. As far as running molecular dynamics, again, if you run it without arguments, it tells you you need this uh, simulation file. So if, for example, if I run this ethane.md, which is just an input simulation that I read in uh, inside of that program, it tells me what molecule I get, my temperature, how big of a box I want. I want it to be a sphere. I'm going to run for half a picosecond, a time step of 0.1 femtoseconds, how long, how, when I, how frequently I print out the geometry and the energy, what files I do that to, etc. So if I do, for example, shift enter. So that gives me a status update every couple seconds about how far along my simulation has gone, depending on how often I tell it to do so. Then that's going to output a thing like this. Here's my geometry file, ethane.xyz. It's got a whole bunch of uh, different uh, trajectories in there, a bunch of different, tells you the current time at each step. Also prints out the energy. It starts by printing out all the factors that went into the input file that you gave it so you can reproduce that simulation. And then 
uh, various columns of energy components, total, kinetic, potential, non-bonded, bonded, boundary, van der Waals, electrostatic, bond, angle, torsion, out of plane. And then inside this uh, simulate.py module is really where the action is going on in terms of that stuff, the molecular dynamics class. And the real magic occurs in this uh, run function where I have basically here's the loop where I'm doing uh, update the coordinates, get the gradient, velocities, update those, and then check to print everything out. Um, and then that all goes to a simulation, which I can see in VMD, if I can bring it up. And at the end of this, what you get if you load that output file, you get a movie of what the system does over time. So for the most part, in half a picosecond, it's mostly just vibrations of bonds and, and uh, bond angles. But over larger periods of time, you see more interesting behavior, like if you have a larger system, you know, various non-bonded interactions taking place, large structural changes. Just the larger you're willing to simulate, uh, the more information and the neater of a movie you will have to watch as a result for your output.